Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a podcast show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professionals specializing in pediatric dentistry. Thank you for tuning in to Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you and your practice. Brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. And thank you to our Pedo Teeth Talk sponsor, Hugh Freedy, for helping you bring us great content. We couldn't do this without them. Visit them at www.hughfreedy.com. That's H-U-F-R-I-E-D-Y.com. We're here today with Dr. Ray Sang, and we're going to talk about tongue tie, a very popular topic. Dr. Sang earned his DDS and PhD in oral biology and immunology at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, where he was in the inaugural class of the joint DDS-PhD program and funded under the NIDCR Dental Scientist Award while conducting basic science research. He went on to residency in postdoctoral clinical research at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he studied the effects of obesity in young children and dental health. Dr. Sang currently owns two private practices in Cary and Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he has incorporated the principles of translational research into his clinical practice. Dr. Sang also runs the North Carolina Integrative Tongue Tie Center. That's what we're going to talk about. A research center focused on the study of tethered oral tissues. As a clinician and a scientist, his research interests focus on providing evidence for the successes and failures of phrenectomies as it relates to difficulties with breastfeeding, speech, and eating in babies and children. So, Dr. Sang, I'm, I'm going to call you Ray. I'm, I'm, first of all, thank you so much for being with us today because you're the guy, exactly the guy we want to talk to on this subject. So, it seems the debate over dealing with tongue tie has recently emerged in a much bigger way. Like we're hearing about this all the time. We're hearing about it, you know, some, somewhat controversial, perhaps. Is, is that true? Is this something really new out there? So I think the actual concept of a tongue tie correction or phrenectomy or frenulaplasty, it has several names, it's actually been around for quite a while. There's a lot of historical precedent prior to this point. Um, you know, it goes back to the days when midwives would keep a sharp nail that uh, they would use if they saw that the baby was having breastfeeding issues, then they would use that sharp nail and and uh, to cut the um, you know, under the tongue to allow more mobility. Um, Did that I think work? We can do- that worked? It seems to have worked, but I think that, okay. you know, we have better tools and better instruments nowadays. And so I think what you're seeing is just sort of this resurgence um, and interest in, in uh, resolving these issues. And I think that has to do a lot with a focus, you know, sort of a turnaround and focus on breastfeeding and helping moms to really have a good, positive breastfeeding experience with their children. So I was looking up tongue tie, you know, online, just like every mom does, you know, does a Google search. So I did what they would probably do. And I, I looked it up and I, it came up with the following. It says it's a condition that restricts the tongue's range of motion. It's very common, more than 3 million cases per year in the U.S. And these are the four characteristics, one of which I thought was very interesting. Treatable by medical professional. Okay. Usually self-diagnosable. I'll stop with that. Self-diagnosable. So, so in other words, they're actually telling the moms that you can decide if your child has a tongue tie, not a frenum, but a tongue tie. Right. Um, I'm not sure that I would agree with that one. I think that um, moms can certainly tell you whether they're having difficulty breastfeeding and uh, they can describe the problems. Uh, but, you know, the tongue tie is one of several uh, different factors that may impede a, a baby's ability to feed. And I think that um, with the help of our uh, lactation consultants and people in other auxiliary fields that help with all that, I think that um, we can certainly, we, we need to work together. I, I don't know that I would say that mothers are, are diagnosing correctly, at least. I think that they're the they're the best people to tell us what problems are, are happening and what they're feeling. But I think that we need to have a collaboration among um, other healthcare professionals to sort of make sure that we're diagnosing correctly, I think is, is what we're, aim- we're all aiming for. We're all aiming for correct diagnosis and not over treatment or under treatment, but just getting it right, hopefully. So in terms of the sort of uptick, if you will, in parents, at least, or moms perceiving that their problem with breastfeeding is related to tongue tie, Maybe to start out, how extensive, number one, are problems with breastfeeding? And then number two, how much of that is actually really related to tongue tie in your experience and with the science? 
Sure. So I can tell you um, where I'm coming from, and the perspective that I'm offering here today is one of a practitioner who had um, sort of is trained in research and basic science, and uh, and as well as translational research, and really took an interest in this because one of the um, segments that we are really uh, working on is being able to uh, see children from birth all the way through adulthood and being there for moms and really establishing this, this dental home model. So I think that if your 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 focus is on the dental home, we really have a responsibility to focus on this segment of children because you know I think that I don't think my practices are altogether that unusual from others. We struggle to see babies at one year of age. We struggle to have our pediatricians refer kids so that we can establish a dental home at one year of age. So this is really a nice way to sort of shore up that segment. You know, when we look at the statistics, according to the CDC, about about 83.8 or 84% of children are ever breastfed. So uh, we see that a lot of kids have their breast, um, and uh, we are encouraging moms to do that. But when you actually look at the hard numbers, um, the percentage of kids that are breastfed still at six months drops to about 57%. And then at one year, it drops even further to about 36%. So I think what we're seeing so just to now- inter- Just to interrupt for one second, mm-hmm. Ray, if I, could in- sure. if I could interrupt you for one second, I probably should have clarified my question. So the, the breastfeeding problem that might be associated with tongue tie is going to be identified at a much younger age, typically in the first few weeks. Is that right? Well, I think, um, and I think the theme of this talk is going to be it depends. So yes, the majority of these problems should be um, should identify themselves, you know, hopefully within the first few months or first few days of life. But we have uh, moms that are uh, maybe first time moms, so maybe there certainly is some of this, these problems can be chucked up to just inexperience. And we always and some moms don't get to really work with lactation consultants, and um, and so uh, you know, I think there is a variability in terms of uh, parents. Moms' exposure to people who are knowledgeable in terms of the, the, the issues that they're facing. And I think that, you know, even among the breastfeeding and lactation consultant world, they're, they're what pe- people are referred to as tongue tie seat lactation consultants versus not. So I think that just has to do with education level. I think the theme that you're going to see across our talk here and, and also that you see when you talk to other people is there really is no sort of unified protocol that everyone can agree on. And so that, that, raises problems in terms of diagnosis and should or is this something that can be overcome just with practice or is it something where we really need to intervene and, and use um, scissors or a laser or something to actually do perform a frenuloplasty or frenulectomy? Interesting. I'm going to come back to that question of how many, how much of the problem of breastfeeding is actually from a scientific perspective related to tongue tie. But before I do that, you just talked about no universal assessment tool And I think that's why this podcast is so valuable to our our pediatric dental colleagues, because regardless if one uh, treats tongue tie for whatever reason or not, we need to be experts on assessing it and assessing its existence in the same way that we should be experts in growth and development status, even though we may not undertake orthodontic treatments in the practice. So I, I know you and I talked, Ray, and you've got a pretty extensive and a very impressive protocol, um, how to assess uh, the problems associated with breastfeeding and a lot of other things for young, for babies. Uh, Maybe you could just, and we can't see it, but could you talk us through that? And I'd like also, please, you to tell us why you decided to do that and then tell us all about it. Sure. So we've been doing tongue tie revisions in our practice for about three years, and it really started just with me um, going through and looking at um, going to some CE courses and really just getting sort of a cursory, um, you know, survey of knowledge that was out there. I went to a couple different courses or some that were offered through Boston University, and of course, there's a lot more courses nowadays for our um, colleagues to pick from. So, um, but even prior to getting into it, I went to a lot of courses before we actually engaged in uh, performing the procedure, and really, I was looking to see what information each of these um, courses had in common. And and as we've sort of worked through that and we've had our own experiences with, um, I think we're over seven or 800 patients now uh, uh, over the three years. Um, as, as we've done that, we've sort of uh, figured out which things are more important, which things are less important. We've worked with um, what we would consider tongue-tie savvy lactation consultants, and we've talked with ENTs, and we've talked with pediatricians. And um, I've really tried to make sure to get all perspectives and, and perspectives from all parties involved in terms of how to come up with the 
tool. So our tool is actually based on uh, things that we've taken from CE courses and things that we've taken from uh, Dr. Richard Baxter's book. We've looked at, he has a uh, uh, an excellent primer on tongue ties and how to get into this field and, and what's involved. Uh, and so he has a, a clinical assessment form in the back and we've sort of tweaked that a little bit and used parts of his, used parts of ours. We've had um, information that we've talked to parents that we think is important. So that's what our assessment tool is. Um, in terms of our assessment tool, I think that it, it we talk about an assessment tool, but this is really something that if you're ready to integrate this into your practice, that it has to, it, it has arms or it reaches into a couple different areas. And I'll go through all of that in terms of your new patient exams and your recall exams. So on our, and now that currently what exists in our practice is on our new patient medical history forms, we actually have a section and that also includes our periodic medical update form, which, you know, every six months, or every 12 months, depending on what you want to do in your practice, um, we actually have a section of questions that asks if the patient has ever had problems with breastfeeding, eating, gagging, or speech. And under each of those questions, has your child ever had problems with breastfeeding, we list out a few of the most typical symptoms and parents can check yes or no. All right. So that's the first thing. It's, it's not just a form that uh, we have someone coming to do a consultation. So then we break out that form. It really is something that pervades our whole practice. And we're screening all of our patients because I think one of the criticisms of overtreatment is that, oh, well, everyone that walks in there gets their tongue lasered. Um, so it, as, as a research center, as a practice that's focused on research, we want to be sampling all of our patients to get baseline not, information. Not, ju- about. not just the ones who come to you with a chief complaint. You're actually exactly. have a denominator. Your denominator includes everyone. Exactly. Therefore, you can actually look at the prevalence much more accurately. Exactly. And and our practice, when we started our practice, as we designed our health history forms and everything, I should mention that um, we designed them with the same categories and same types of questions, demographic questions, and so on and so forth, that the NIDCR uses, the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. So we use the NIH um, type questions so that as we go back and we do chart reviews, we can pull out a lot of demographic information that's publication ready. And so that helps us just sort of streamline the process. Now, we do ask those questions on a form. And then during our new patient or recall exams, we'll ask again if the child has had any problems with breastfeeding, eating, gagging, or speech. And that may seem redundant, but uh, we do we do actually have quite a few parents where uh, they say, no, they don't have any problems. Well, uh, well, I mean, they're picky, you know, let's say we're talking about eating, they're picky eaters. And then that conversation really gives rise to a lot of other things. Now, again, I think the criticism may be that we're looking for kids to phrenectomize or anything like that. And and as we get, as I get through the, the late part of this, talk about what our assessment tool is and how we actually use it, you'll find that we have a lot of checks and balances for making sure that we don't over-treat, but also that we don't under-treat. So when we ask patients verbally, they've already filled out a form, we ask them and re- ask them to re-verify again if they've had any of the sample symptoms. And we actually give different ones than the ones that are listed on the health history form. So now parents have been exposed to reading or hearing about a couple different things, and that can sometimes spark some interest or uh, spark some some details that they begin to remember, um, and that gives us some clues. So we really have to understand that there, there are multiple reasons that kids can have problems with breastfeeding, eating, or speech, and a phrenectomy is not the answer to all of them. So uh, to that end, we, we, um, the answers to the questions are only one component of our treatment model. We really have to make sure that we do a clinical assessment, that we have symptoms that are occurring previously or currently, that parents understand the information that surrounds it, and that they are able to make an informed decision. I think that's what all of our listeners really want parents to be able to do is to understand the risks, benefits, and outcomes that we expect um, and have them make an informed decision about what's right for their child. Truly, I don't think that there is a one right answer. I think that that right answer depends on individual circumstances. So we just have to make sure that we're honest with parents and, and really talk about that. That sounds fantastic. We're, we're going to pause now for a word from our sponsor. Hugh Freedy is the global leader in dental instrument manufacturing and infection prevention solutions that keep you performing at your best. For more information on Hugh Freedy products, visit HughFreedy.com slash AAPD crowns. That's Hugh-Freedy.com slash AAPD crowns. And enter the promo code 2682 if placing an order for pedo crowns. We are back with Dr. Ray Sang, and we're talking about tongue tie, 
about breastfeeding and uh, the ability of correction of tongue tie to, to allow breastfeeding in some situations. And Ray, we were talking about your assessment mechanism, and you just went at length and told us very nicely and clearly how you make that assessment and how you elicit the responses through a conversation from your tool with the parent. So are you telling me that uh, there's not a single way just to open a kid's mouth, look at the frenum and say, yep, you need a phrenectomy or no, you don't. It's much more complicated than that. Well, I think that um, there, there's a couple different things that sort of complicate this. And I always like to bring in examples that we're all familiar with, all our colleagues are. So if you see um, a tooth that has, let's say, interproximal decay, that's halfway or almost to the DEJ, um, the same, you could ask the same question, is the crown the right treatment or is SDEF the right treatment or is monitoring the right treatment? So I think in the same way that we understand it with caries control, that's, there's a couple different factors that we have to consider. That The same applies with this. This is not a, it's either broken or it's not. It really depends on um, what the parental factors are, what the baby factors are, and, and really making sure to have a, a clear discussion. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So when we have patients that come to us, they've already, the majority of our patients that come to us have already been screened by a lactation consultant. For the purpose of this station, we'll just limit it to breastfeeding. The the speech and the eating, that, that brings up a lot of other things that we can certainly discuss at a later time. But with breastfeeding, we do have a lot of patients that have been already screened by the pediatrician, and they've been screened by um, a lactation consultant. And the lactation consultant basically has said, we have tried everything we can to fix this, and the problem still exists. Can you check them for a tongue tie? And so we, we bring them in, and we look at um, the lips and the tongues, and we have to look to see if there is restrictive anatomy. And so when we talk about our decision tree and treating these and whether to offer phrenectomy as treatment, our first criteria, and we have three, the first criteria is that there must be restrictive anatomy. If their tongue can go everywhere and their lip can go everywhere and we don't see any um, restrictions or anything that would uh, you know cause a problem, then we really have to talk to parents about maybe looking elsewhere to see if there's other factors that, that um, may be affecting a child's ability to eat. So the first criteria is they have have to have restrictive anatomy. So the that's sec- a, that's a must. If they if they don't have restriction, then they're not going to get a phrenectomy. Is that what you're saying? In our practice, we would hold off on that, and we would want to wait until we had really ruled out everything else. And at some point, there are very very few. Uh, patients of ours, and I can count them on one hand, that they have tried every single thing, other thing, and we have talked to parents, and we almost try to dissuade them from getting it, but we do it as a Hail Mary. If you have tried every other thing, gone through therapy, you've had genetics, you've had GI, you've had all this stuff, and you really still feel strongly that you're willing to undertake a phrene- undergo a phrenectomy or have your child undergo a phrenectomy with the understanding that there may not be any guaranteed improvement or anything like that, then we can have that discussion with parents. And I think we, we only have that discussion with parents because we're comfortable in our technique and our equipment to know that we will essentially not really doing any harm to the child, but we may not be doing uh, we may we don't know for sure that there's going to be any benefit, but if they've tried every other thing and the parents are still on board with that, then we're we're amenable to that. You mentioned there are a couple other. There's one other criterion, one or two others. Sure. There's two other criteria that we use, and this applies to every model. And, th- and we had talked about this in terms of making sure we don't undertreat or overtreat. So the second criteria is we feel patients should have some sort of functional symptom. There should be some symptom that you can measure or quantify, whether qualitatively or quantitatively, that we can say after we do a phrenectomy that you know we can look at it again and decide whether we actually made any changes. Um, this really speaks to some of the literature, well, I don't know if I would call it literature, The some of the information on the internet that says, you know, you should clip every baby now because they're going to have all these problems as adults. We're happy to do that when the research comes out to support and show in an unbiased fashion what those long-standing effects are. And I know that'll be a controversial statement for some of our listeners, but I think as healthcare providers, we really have to rely on research and say, here are the symptoms. We do, you know, this action, and then we look to see did the symptoms improve. So uh, we have some patients that come to us and say, well, we're done with breastfeeding. Uh, but I want to make sure they don't have speech or eating problems. And a lot of times we ask parents to just wait until those problems show up. And so our second criteria is while previous symptoms are indicative of whether, you know, there may be future problems, we really need to have current symptoms that we can fix and examine after we do the treatment plan. And I think uh, after we do the treatment, sorry. sorry. Um, and I think that's that helps us to 
keep from over treating or um, you know kind of trying to solve problems that we never knew if they were going to occur or not. And then the third is finally, parents need to be able to make an informed decision. They need to know the pros and cons of not doing anything, of doing just the lip or doing just the tongue, or going through uh, more lactation consultants uh, and lactation consulting services, or you know that all the options. We really need to lay out all the options and let parents be the drivers of that process so that they can make a decision. So when we look at those three factors, that there's restrictive anatomy, that there's current symptoms, and that parents understand and are actively choosing that the symptoms they want to fix are important enough to undergo a laser procedure, then we proceed. That's fantastic. That's a wonderful take on assessment. We don't have a lot of time left, sadly. It was going quickly. So I want to jump in in this very last part to talk about the treatment. And you mentioned laser. Uh, Has the advent of lasers into practice made it, on one hand, easier to do phrenectomies? You mentioned originally they were done with the fingernail. Uh, Some people still use scissors. Some use a a Bard Parker blade. Uh, Has has the fact that people have lasers made it uh, easier, let's say? Or what, what has been the effect of having lasers more available? So I think the lasers have been around for a while, but we're seeing a newer generation of lasers like the Solea laser or the light scalpel CO2, which seem to be pretty popular. I think lasers in general have become more accessible to dentists. So we have uh, pediatric dentists and general dentists also that have more accessibility. To them. They've come down in price. They're more available. There's a lot more options. I think when we look at our medical colleagues and we look at our um, dental colleagues and which tools they're using, I think the adage is correct that it's not so much the tool that's used. I think it's the the provider and what tool, you know, how they uh, uh, go about constructing or having the architecture of of a perfect phrenectomy happen. So I think that you can use a pair of scissors. I think you so operator technique is is really the thing you're saying there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I do think that we do see a good amount of um, phrenectomies that are done with scissors that are done really fast. And so it's difficult to assess, did you actually go deep enough or did you solve all the problems? For You may solve the breastfeeding problem, but one of the things that we're starting to see, because we have a lot of patients that had that were, so to speak, clipped after a couple of days with a pair of scissors, now they're having eating and speed problems. So did you solve one problem and not address the others? Or could a deep enough cut have solved future problems? And I know what I just said, but about, you know, having current symptoms. But I think that as we learn more about this and have a more uniform assessment tool, we'll be able to figure out what the correct architecture of a, a perfect phrenectomy is. So that deep enough cut would really not be a function of the tool either, because you could make a shallow or a deep cut with any of the techniques you mentioned, lasers, scissors, blade, right? It's just a matter of knowing how deeply to cut in a certain situation. Correct. And I think some of that comes with experience. And I think that's where you have to go to CE courses and really critically evaluate the information that you get there. And so I I think that for those of our listeners who are wanting to get into this, I would encourage you to go to different courses and really look at, uh, try to glean information about technique. But at the same time, glean information about whether the research data is there to support, you know, the words that are coming out of the presenter's mouth. And, and I think recently there was a paper published uh, in a medical journal, and there were several actually, but I'm not, so I don't know exactly which one I'm referring to, but I think you know that that was the case. And it, it talked about the fact that many phrenectomies that are done for the purpose of assisting the ability to breastfeed are perhaps not necessary or didn't solve the problem. Are, are you know what I'm talking about? I get a lot of attention. I do. Yeah. yeah, I think there was one, and I, I think on uh, some of the social media groups like IPDO and ITOTS, we were talking about yes, some of that Yes, they were stuff. posting that, and they were referring to that particular one that I'm mentioning. The exact, the exact reference, I don't have it in my hands now, but I think you know what I mean. Yep, I know which one you're talking about. And I think that um, my assessment of that is that there is incomplete information um, to make that assessment. Again, when you, if you're not looking for something, then you're usually not going to see it. And I think that's the case here. I think with a, a renewed attention to breastfeeding, we have a lot of people getting into this, uh, this tongue tie phenomenon. And I think that pediatric dentists absolutely have a place there. I think that if we are providing a dental home and we're working, we're, we're trying to provide parents with resources to address anything that happens in the oral cavity, then absolutely the pediatric dentists have a seat at that table. ENTs do also. Pediatricians do also. Lactation consultants do also. And I think one of the difficulties of this particular topic is that it's not just, it doesn't just sit in dentistry or medicine. It actually spans 
a couple different fields, and all of them have pretty significant expertise to offer. It's just you're trying to get you know five or ten different fields. A lot of cooks lot in the of, kitchen. You said a lot of a cooks, lot of in, cooks the kitchen, in the though. kitchen. Exactly. You have a lot of people that are are have a lot of expertise that help this. And we really, it's it's almost like this is too interdisciplinary. There's too many disciplines that are important. So I think we're just learning how to manage that. Yes. My daughter is a speech and language pathologist, and she weighs in on it too with me sometimes with her patients. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and you know, as you, if you don't focus just on breastfeeding, now you have speech therapists, feeding therapists, you have body workers, you have all these other people. And I think for me, the key has always been, where's the research? Do we have the research? And I think that's where we have to, we're, we're at a point where if we want to move forward with our, with our medical colleagues, our pediatricians, and have uniform information, we got to slow down and get some research to back up what we're saying. Well, that's fantastic. And our last moment here, I just wanted to ask you, when you, you've, you've done an amazing job com- talking about how you communicate this with parents, which is really the key to all of this. And you've done a super job at not only the assessment tool, bringing sort of a critical thinking to this. Um, When you talk about doing a phrenectomy and you talked before about the need to do it properly, what are the downsides of doing a phrenectomy, you know, in terms of to the extent that there probably are some that maybe we find out that didn't cure the problem? Uh, What what is the, what are the technical specific uh, consequences, negative consequences doing a phrenectomy, adverse outcomes, let's say? I'm not talking about the surgical site and assuming it all heals correctly. What are the long-term consequences that might be negative? So I think that's a really great question. And I think that I will give my answer from the perspective that I have of a practitioner who's been doing this for a couple of years. There are certainly people in our in our profession that have been doing this for much longer and many more phrenectomies than we than I've done. Um, and I know this is hard to believe. And in, in, in my experience, I really haven't actually seen any downsides to this. Um, we certainly have had uh, phrenectomies completed on patients who didn't comply with stretches or parents were unable to really um, do the aftercare that they needed to do. Um, and so those ones have had not great outcomes, but I think that we have not had any patient that has zero improvement. We have always have, there are always some symptoms with regards to breastfeeding, and we have a list of 17 or 18 symptoms that we go through with parents. We have always had at least, I would say, at least a 20% recovery rate in terms of symptoms. So we reduce the number of symptoms by at least 20%. Now, we are not perfect. We are still following up on our patients that we did three years ago, and we're trying to see, uh, contact them and see if they've had speech and and eating problems to see if there's anything that we needed to tweak about our technique but i think this is one of those fields that as that has very little downside and let me just say that with, with phrenectomies i get it i understand why people are so zealous about it and so in favor of it because i always think this is like what orthodontists feel like when they finish a case and everything looks beautiful and you go back and look where you came from and you look where you are and you can appreciate that and you've made a difference in a person's life but making a difference in a baby's life within a matter of minutes is really really a powerful powerful experience for the practitioner and I think that's why we have practitioners that are just full speed ahead. And it's like, I'm not waiting for research. I know it works. But but really, truly in the future, if we want this to be um, something that we can all embrace and get together on and really, really do something for parents that that they need, uh, we got to slow down a little bit and, you know, look back and make sure we have some research to support what we're doing. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sang. I, I really love your thoughtful, balanced and uh, evidence-based approach and You can see how your training in uh, bringing uh, critical thinking into every situation has benefited your patients. And I think now all of us will have our patients uh, have greater benefit by listening to what you have to say. So thank you, Dr. Sang, very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for tuning in today to Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to your practice. Brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. We'll see you next time. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry offers continuing education courses on a wide variety of subjects. Do you sedate children in your office? Attend the Safe and Effective Sedation Course. Preparing for your board exam? Attend the Qualifying Exam Prep Course. Interested in an overview of the advances in pediatric dentistry? Attend Comprehensive Review. There are so many ways to earn CE with AAPD. Visit aapd.org for more information. 
For 10% off of any course, use discount code Teeth Talk when registering. Pedo Teeth Talk is brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the show that delivers cutting edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry. If you have any questions or comments, please email info at aapd.org. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.